Welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Jordan Lloyd and Colourgraph. Peter Moore. Today is the 28th of August, which is the anniversary of the famous March on Washington in 1963. It's the occasion, of course, when Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech. We thought that this was the perfect spur for a visit back to the 1960s and to the civil rights movement. As the 1960s began, the world was primed for change. In the 15 years since the Second World War had ended, it had become increasingly clear that the old colonial order was defunct. As the European powers withdrew, Africa in particular was being seen as a continent reborn. But no country on the planet was drawing quite as much attention as the Caribbean island of Cuba. In 1959, the revolutionaries had astonishingly come down from the Sierra and ousted the sitting president, Fulgencio Batista. As Simone de Beauvoir put it, the Cuban Revolution had exploded like a miracle under the blue sky. The revolutionary leader, now known as the Maximum Leader, Fidel Castro, was a new and transfixing presence in global politics. Immediately, Castro set about remaking Cuban society and dismantling the racial segregation that had long since characterised it. All of this was unsettling to the outgoing Eisenhower administration in Washington, D.C., as 1960 began and a UN Council meeting crept closer, people were primed for a confrontation between the old and the new. Here to tell us much more about this fascinating history today is the historian Simon Hall. Simon is Professor of Modern History at the University of Leeds and he's the author of a new microhistory of Castro's fabled visit to New York in September 1960. It's called Ten Days in Harlem, Fidel Castro and the Making of the 1960s. We're going to be giving away a couple of copies of this book, so do keep listening for details about how to win. You'll get to them very soon. But first of all, it was to the 1960s that I headed with Simon on a travel back through time. First off, I should welcome you to the Travels Through Time podcast. It's a real pleasure to be talking to you, Simon. Thanks. Yes, great to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Right. Your work as a historian, I thought it's pretty good if we could just characterise it, because you focused on the mid 20th century world. And I just wanted to ask um, what it was that entices you in general towards that time. Yeah, so I guess I've been drawn to the mid 20th century United States in particular, and especially the the decade of the 1960s, uh, which I've kind of worked on, studied and taught for the best part of of 20 years. And, you know, I I first encountered this sort of subject matter when I was an undergraduate student at the University of, of Sheffield, and I took a, a final year a course on the American Civil Rights Movement with, with a great historian called Robert Cook. And that, that course just really captured my imagination. And I think the thing that kind of really drew me in was the emphasis that was placed on the role that sort of everyday regular people played in, in making and shaping their own their own history. And, you know, as someone who was a, who was a student at the time studying the history of, of student activism, it just kind of, yeah, kind of lit a, lit, lit a sort of spark of interest that has sort of continued, really. Hmm. Okay. We should also mention that a lot of the discussion we're going to have today revolves around your new book, which is called Ten Days in Harlem, Fidel Castro and the Making of the Sixties. Could you just give us a little bit of an overview of the book, please? Yeah, sure. So this is a history of uh, the, the trip that Fidel made to New York City in September of 1960 to attend the opening of the General Assembly of the United Nations, which was a great sort of set piece diplomatic occasion. It was the so-called Year of Africa, so I think something like 16 new, newly independent African states were joining the United Nations. It was taking place at the height of the Cold War, where we had Eisenhower kind of facing down uh, Nikita Khrushchev. After a day, after a bit less than 24 hours in a sort of quite fancy midtown hotel, uh, Fidel stormed out complaining about poor, disrespectful treatment. They had a row over money. He went off to the United Nations headquarters, harangued the Secretary General, um, Dag Hammarskjöld, 
threatened to set up a temporary uh, camp in the UN Rose Garden, and then eventually relocated uh, himself and his entire delegation to the Hotel Teresa in, in the, the heart of, of Harlem. He sort of used the Teresa as a base there to sort of hold court over the coming days with a whole succession of statesmen and other political and cultural luminaries. So his first guest was, was Malcolm X, and that sort of really set the tone for the rest of the, of the stay. Uh, and it became a kind of really... I think iconic moment in the history of the of the nineteen sixties, and I used the, the the ten days or so that he was in, or the ten days that he was in Harlem for, as a way of exploring three or four big historical themes. Really, one is the changing dynamics of the of the Cold War and the deteriorating relationship between Cuba and the United States, and Cuba's growing closeness with the Soviet Union. Uh, use it to explore uh, the story of um, decolonization, particularly decolonization in in Africa, and the kind of wider trajectory of the global movement against imperialism, also to talk about the international dimensions of the of the black freedom struggle in the United States and the wider kind of emergence of the political and cultural radicalism that goes on to define the, the decade. So it's a it's a book that focuses t- quite tightly on this 10 day stay in Harlem, but uses it to talk about some much bigger themes and historical developments. Yeah, it's a really good idea um, as a micro history and this idea of telling stories which tell bigger stories you know, taking you into um, some really big moments in history there. Of course, um, I suppose we're familiar with this idea of the summit now. People are always going off to the G7 or G8, I'm not sure which it is, or the, or the EU or, or, or what, ha- what have you. And sometimes they feel like quite, I suppose, bureaucratic and in a, in a, in a way boring events where people just chat away and nothing happens but this was quite different wasn't it this particular meeting in New York in 1960 yeah it was very different it definitely wasn't um, a meeting that followed a, a sort of set script which is often what these summits seem to do these days everyone sort of agrees in advance what's going to happen and then they, they just turn up for the sort of the photo shoots this was mm. a, a meeting that was became sort of wildly unpredictable partly because of Castro himself who you know, by his very nature, was kind of um, rebellious and had a slightly anarchic quality. His antics definitely um, don't follow any pre-planned kind of script. And and he's great at improvising. So, um, you know, at one point, Eisenhower uh, deliberately excludes him from a, um, a lunch that he's holding for the leaders of Latin America. And so Fidel just goes back to the Teresa and, and treats, I think, 12 employees, black employees of the hotel to lunch and a, a round of beers. And of course, make sure that the press are there to, to take the photographs and record the event. And he makes a big show about how he's um, much more honoured to eat lunch with the humble ordinary people of Harlem than with the you know the terrible imperialist leaders of the of the United States and then the other character who's kind of injecting a a sort of improvisational quality uh, and a slightly rough and ready quality to this um, UN General Assembly is Nikita Khrushchev he switches between two moods he's often very jocular and um, and amusing he holds lots of impromptu press conferences with journalists from the balcony of the Soviet mission on Park Avenue and he's happy to kind of josh with with journalists and kind of play the fool a little bit and have some fun. But in the General Assembly itself, he's very belligerent. He is he, repeatedly jumping to his feet, um, gesticulating. Um, he's quite sort of aggressive in his own speech to the General Assembly. And of course, famously, at one point when um, I think it's a delegate from the Philippines is accusing the Soviet Union of practicing colonialism in Eastern Europe, he jumps to his feet and takes off his uh, shoe and bangs it on the uh, on the desk. So it's uh, it's uh, an international summit that has a very different feel and look to it than, than some of the very sort of staid and stiff occasions that we're used to seeing um, today. Okay, well, we'll have all this as a uh as an opening to what we're going to talk about next. And um, the question I always ask of everyone when they come on this podcast is if you could go back to a year in the past to explore it, what year would you pick? And I'm pretty much guessing that 1960 is the one that we're going to today. Yeah, so I've, I picked the year the year 1960. Okay, um, let me yeah. ask you a few questions and um, just about the world in 1960. And you mentioned something earlier that I want to pick up on, and you said it was the year of Africa. Could you explain that a bit for me, please? Yeah, so I, f- I forget who it was who who dubbed it the Year of Africa, but it, it took on this uh, this name, I suppose, the Year of Africa, and that, that was because, well, that was in recognition of the fact the pace of decolonization had picked up to such an extent that a, a large number of, of newly independent African states were joining the United Nations in the autumn of 1960, including the Congo, uh, Niger, Nigeria, Senegal. So it was a big moment in the history of 
of European decolonization and of African independence. You know, when, when the United Nations was, was set up by the great powers, they had no real intention of giving up their, their empires. But a combination of, of factors, including you know, economic overstretch, military weakness, and the strength of indigenous anti-colonial nationalist movements themselves, meant that decolonization was taking place at a, at a pace that, that no one had really foreseen in, 19, in 1945. 1960 is a, is a really big year, a symbolically important year, in the history of uh, the end of European empire. So that's one of the big things geo mm. in, in the sort of geopolitical frame that's happening in, in 1960. And the other big thing, of course, is it was an election year as well in the United States. You say it was on the cusp of seismic political and social change. Is that right? Yeah, so I guess, you know, you can be a bit glib about presidential elections and say that they're all they're all historic, they all matter. But the one in 1960 really uh, seemed to have um, a particular quality to it. And part of that was because it, it symbolised a generational shift in US political leadership. Uh, the race itself was very tight between Vice President Richard Nixon and his uh, opponent, uh, the Massachusetts Senator John F. Kennedy. But both men were relatively young. Nixon was I think 47 and Kennedy 43 and crucially both of them had been born in the 20th century so it was the first time in American history that someone born in the 20th century was going to lead the country so symbolically again that was very important. The election itself is taking place at a, mom a moment when we're starting to see the sort of stirrings if you like of a, of a wider generational revolt or generational picking up of, of momentum I suppose politically so we get the beginnings of the direct action phase of the American civil rights movement um, in, in May of 1960 there are the first stirrings of the kind of wider student revolts. There's a big protest in San Francisco uh, against uh, hearings which are being held by the House and American Activities Committee, a, a kind of leading body in the kind of driving forward the so-called Red Scare during the, the 1950s. Thousands of, of, of people, mainly students, take to the, um, the streets outside San Francisco City Hall to protest against anti-communism, basically. So we, we're beginning to see this kind of upsurge in, in student activism, which, which is something that goes on to, in large part, define the political culture of the 1960s. And then we should probably, um, well, we, we can't escape this last bit of context that I'm just going to add here, which, I mean, we, sp we spoke about Africa and many of the newly decolonized independent nations there. But if there was one nation that people were looking at with particular interest, it was Cuba, because the previous year in January, you'd had Castro's entering of Havana, the replacement of Batista. This idea, this kind of romantic notion of the guerrillas coming down from the mountains to take control. And so lots of things are happening throughout 1959 and into 1960 in Cuba, aren't they? Yeah, so um, Fidel had arrived back in, in, in Cuba from exile in Mexico at the end of 1956 in what had been a pretty disastrous landing. And um, only about a dozen of the 80 rebels had, had survived the landing without being captured or, or killed, um, including Fidel, his brother Raul and Che Guevara. And they'd kind of regrouped in the Sierra Maestro mountains and then led this guerrilla campaign in conjunction with a, a kind of quite well-developed urban opposition that had eventually swept Batista out of power in, in January 1959. Quite quickly, Fidel had set about creating a genuinely revolutionary government in, in Cuba. The period between January 1959 and coming to New York in September of 1960, relations with the United States deteriorate quite severely, largely in response, the Americans' response to Castro's economic policies, which was to nationalise a lot of American-owned sugar mills and sugarcane farms, and to make it clear that he was determined to exercise economic sovereignty as well as political sovereignty. It had very quickly sparked worries in Washington that he was you know, either a communist or a communist sympathiser or someone that was in danger of falling into the kind of communist camp. And, you know, this is all happening at the height of the of the Cold War contest between the Soviet Union and the, and the United mm -hmm. States. But his revolution had, while it had sort of alarmed uh, the Eisenhower administration, it had captured the imagination of, of two groups of people in the United States, kind of young, white uh, left-wing students and, symp and sympathisers who had seen in Castro's revolution a kind of maybe a slightly romanticised alternative to the, the kind of politics of the old left and the, which was dominated by debates over, over communism. But it, it also captured the imagination of, of African-Americans because within weeks of taking power, uh, he had committed Cuba to an official policy of racial equality mm. and had immediately uh, passed a series of laws outlawing segregation in, in privately owned social clubs, restaurants and beaches. And, you know, Cuba is just 90 miles off the coast of the segregated South. And this is happening at a time when the Eisenhower administration is saying, yeah, we, we believe in racial equality, but you can't do these things overnight. You have to be patient. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, this is the perfect way for us to, to get going on this exploration of 1960, because we're going to talk a little bit more about this in specific now. And if you tell us 
where you'd like to go for your first of your three scenes, we can dive into this particular history a bit more. Yeah, so I want to go to the very sort of average looking lunch counter or sort of in-store uh, restaurant at the F.W. Woolworth department store in downtown Greensboro, North Carolina. And I want to go there on the afternoon of um, Monday, February the 1st, 1960. OK, well, can you justify that? Why would you like to go there? I want to go there. I definitely don't want to go there for the for the food. Um, <laughs> and the food is perfectly fine, but it was no great culinary experience. It's sort of 50 cent um, sandwiches and toasted cheese and uh, an apple pie and stuff apparently some nice ice cream sodas it's not it's not for the it's not for the food it's because i think it has a this this particular place um has a, a great claim to to be the birthplace of the modern civil rights movement so i'm going to let you take the story a bit forward before i start asking you questions can you tell us what happens on the afternoon among the apple pies and the sodas yeah yeah so four african american college students uh, freshman students at uh, the nearby north carolina agricultural and technical college four guys, uh, Joseph McNeil, Franklin McCain, uh, David Richmond and Ezel Blair Jr. They enter the Woolworth store late that afternoon. They purchase a few items, some toothpaste, a notebook, and then they walk into the lunch counter, a lunch counter which is for whites only. Uh, they sit down at the service counter itself and they ask if they can order some coffee. And the waitress uh, tells them no, using the kind of language of the time. She says, you know, we don't serve Negroes. And they say, well, we've just been served in the store. Our money is good is good in the store. Why, why can't we buy coffee here? Again, they're refused service. And rather than getting up and leaving, they, they stay seated. And by staying seated, they throw the whole place into a total confusion. Nobody really knows what to do. At one point, an African-American woman, a relatively elderly African-American woman who works in the kitchen comes out and sort of admonishes them, you know, you should follow the rules. You're, you know, you know that you, you have to order lunch, uh, not at the lunch counter, but at the hot dog stand over the way. They remain uh, seated. The manager, a, a guy called Curly Harris, Clarence Harris, comes out and asks them if they'll leave and again they they refuse at one point a police officer comes in uh, this is probably the most nerve-wracking part of the whole protest really um when the police officer comes in he walks up and down behind them doesn't say anything but he he sort of taps his billy club into his into the palm of his hand does that for a few minutes and then leaves and the, the four the four students who'd been quite nervous um, when they'd entered the store, they started to have second thoughts until uh, Franklin McCain kind of stiffened their resolve by asking them, he said, um, are you guys chicken or not? And they decided to go ahead with it. But the longer they sit there, and as they as they kind of realise that no one really knows what to do, they start to feel more empowered and they begin to realise that actually, simply by sitting there and not moving, they're exercising power and they have some control over the situation and they're making a, quite a powerful stand. Mm. Anyway... Has... Uh, well, I was just going to say it has actually yeah. echoes of Rosa Parks five years earlier, doesn't it? Yeah, and in, and in terms of the motivation of you know why they did this, I mean that they were aware of the Deep Montgomery push. bus boycott in started in December nineteen fifty five, lasted for over a year. I think at least one of the students had heard Martin Luther King speak um, a couple of years before that, before the sit in in nineteen fifty eight. But the thing that really inspired them to take a stand that day was that they these guys they were they were four close friends, two of them were roommates, they all lived in the same college dorm. They'd had a habit of, of staying up late at night, kind of chewing the fat, talking over current affairs, racial politics. And they just got fed up with the fact that everybody was talking about the race problem, but nobody seemed to be doing anything. And I think that they were themselves guilty that they hadn't done anything about it. And so they came upon this um, very simple idea, which was just to go to the, uh, the Woolworths uh, lunch counter and to demand service. And then they were just going to see what happened. There was no sort of plan beyond beyond that. And, you know, one of the things, they, as I say, one of the things they observe in the lunch counter is that no one else really knows what to do either. Um, ultimately, the, the manager decides to close the store early after about an hour. And interestingly, just before they all leave, a white woman comes up to the student, sit ne sits next to Franklin McCain, who was wearing his Air Force uniform. He was a member of the Reserve Officer Training Corps. And she uh, said to him that she was disappointed with them. And, and, and McCain kind of turned and said, ma'am, why are you disappointed? All we're doing is asking to be treated equally and to be, to be served here like anybody else. And she said, well, I'm disappointed that it took you so long uh, to do this, which is, you know, it was a kind of a really sort of supportive thing to say, really. And they, they get up when the store closes, they leave, they go back to campus and word spread about their protest. They're sort of treated like heroes. They themselves feel kind of victorious and, and empowered. Uh, McCain said later that he felt as though his soul had been cleansed. He said he felt better that day than he'd ever felt in his life. And felt as though he'd regained his his manhood, not just for himself, but for the 
the wider African-American community. And pretty soon, this, these sit-in protests kind of ignite a whole spark of activism mm-hmm. in North Carolina and then across the, the rest of the South. But before we leave these four courageous individuals, I mean, it's a scene which is remarkable for its bravery. I want to ask you what kind of repercussions they could face um, for doing what they did. I mean, there's obviously different types, legal or social, perhaps, you might say. Yeah, I mean, they definitely took a big a big risk um, and they had to show a lot of courage. And they had to kind of, you know, before they went and, and sat in, they had to come to terms with the fact that this protest could have potentially very severe consequences. I mean, North Carolina was not Mississippi, so it, it was not as, on, on the scale of kind of white supremacy, it was not as harsh and oppressive as as the states in, in of the deep south, but it was still very dangerous to to transgress in this way and to mm. and to challenge so overtly the system of, of racial segregation. You know, so it was possible that they could have lost their lives. You know, that was definitely a possibility. More likely was that they could have been arrested and thrown in, into jail. They could have been kicked out of college. They could have uh, their families could have faced uh, harassment. They could have had you know economic um, retaliation against their families. Um, could have had credit cut off, could have uh, had stores refuse to, to supply them with, with goods and services. But yeah. this story does not end when the restaurant closes, does it? it the story no, becomes bigger. It becomes much bigger quite quickly. So the next day, uh, the four go back to the lunch counter. Uh, they're joined by maybe 20 fellow um, students. By the Wednesday, almost all the seats in the in the in the restaurant, the lunch counter, are occupied by protesters. The following week, students in other cities in North Carolina, including Winston Salem, Durham, uh, Raleigh, uh, also stage sit-ins. And by early February, they're spreading outside of North Carolina to neighbouring states. By the end of the spring, something like twenty thousand people had participated in sit-ins. More than seventy towns and cities across the South had been affected. 2,000 so, people have been yeah. arrested. So they become huge. Yeah, mm, they become huge. huge moment of solidarity. It's chronologically interesting for me as well, because we we know um, about the bus boycott in 1955, which is often seen as a kind of real genesis moment for the civil rights. But it's kind of a, quite a long way before the March on Washington. In, is that 63, I think? 63, um, August 63. Yes. Yeah. And, so, I, mean, I think the big I think the big difference between the, the bus boycott in Montgomery and the sit-ins is that the bus boycott involved staying off of a segregated bus. It was about withdrawing sort of custom, if you like. Mm. And there are some, there are boycotts that accompany the sit-ins. So some people who don't want to, to sit in, uh, they boycott the stores as a way of applying economic pressure. But the, the difference of the sit-in is that it's a direct application it's of more assertive. protest. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's demanding service. It's and 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 sit-ins have been used in the past, but they tended to be used to try to generate legal test cases. So you'd go and you'd sit in somewhere, you'd be refused service, you'd leave, and then you'd file a lawsuit. This is an attempt to organise, or it becomes an attempt to organise a kind of sustained campaign of the direct application of, of, of economic and political pressure to bring about segregation there and then. I mean, the Greensboro lunch counter does eventually desegregate in July of 1960, so relatively soon after the, the first sit-in. But the other thing I'd say is that this, one of the reasons the sit-ins can, can kind of spread so quickly is, is partly it's a very simple tactic. So, you know, you can kind of, you understand what a sit-in means very quickly. Yes, yeah, it's, it's um, replicatable, if that's the word. Yeah, but, but the, the key to the sit-in success isn't that there are just lots of one-off sit-ins, but they're, they're able to develop a sustained campaign of sit-in activism. And, and that's because, you know, there are kind of pre-existing organisations and networks of activists. There are people who are experimenting with non-violent direct action workshops and there are and students are easier to organize because they're all you know concentrated on these campuses and that you get a kind of a competitive spirit so if the if the college down the road is staged to sit in and your and your college hasn't students at your college haven't there's a kind of one-upmanship you want to have an even bigger and better sit in mm. than your your kind of local rivals but there is there is violence you know the sit in protesters are they're arrested they're dragged away they're harassed they're beaten up they're roughed up uh, they have uh, ketchup, mustard, sugar, coffee poured over them. Sometimes they have cigarette, cigarettes stubbed out on them. Mm. Um, and the key to their success is that the nonviolent protesters don't respond. Now, that does take training. So in places like Nashville and Atlanta, where you have sustained waves of sit-in campaigners, there's a lot of organisation that goes into, into those campaigns. They're not spontaneous. People are, are trained through role play to how to not respond to provocation, for example. Yeah, that's a really interesting point and one that I was going to ask you earlier on, but you kind of answered it before I got there, it was whether this was a spontaneous action or whether it was planned. But it's it's interesting to see that level 
of coordination but um i think it's captured quite nicely in the book when you quote from the editorial in the new leader which is a conservative publication and yeah. they they are they've got to the point where they're characterizing the two sides and they're looking at these um young african americans reading goethe and sitting quietly and then on the other hand they're seeing them being attacked by people who are throwing cigarette butts at them or whatever it is and they're saying well actually you know who's the more civilized here and turning the question on its head um and it's always the same with these moments um that you have something which is so everyday so domestic almost you know the the the, the fact that you you might just go out for a sandwich or you might go out for some food but realizing that that's an action which is so fraught with danger so to witness it would be quite a thing i think yeah it'd be great i'd love to just sort of take a, a table a sort of discrete distance from the actual counter itself and just observe um observe what happened really and if, if i if i'm allowed to i'd also be quite interested to sort of uh, in a non-intimidating way to sort of follow the the four students as they leave the lunch counter and kind of try and earwig a bit about what, what they're discussing as they're walking back to campus now that would be a fascinating bit of yeah. oral history absolutely yeah. I mentioned at the very start of this episode that today marks the anniversary of 1963's March on Washington. Well, I wanted to let you know about a wonderful visual history project that our partner Jordan Lloyd has been working on. He's been commissioned by the website Unsplash to create a set of colourised images around the events of that time, and the results are absolutely stunning. I've been enjoying them over the last few days. You can see in this set of colourised pictures, for the very first time in about 50 years, the colours on the placards that people are holding, the details of the clothing, the faces, the complexion of the marches. If you want to go and have a look at them as well, you can find a little selection on our website, which is tttpodcast.com, but we'll also put a link there so you can go and see the full set at Unsplash. So once again, that's a set of colourised images by Jordan Lloyd about the March on Washington in 1963. Please do go and check it out. Well, brilliant. Well, let's let's keep going. We're going to go on to your second scene a little bit later on in 1960. Now, where would you like to take us to next, please? Yeah, so I want to go to the Hotel Teresa um, in Harlem, and specifically to its ballroom, the Sky the Skyline Lounge, um, on the evening of Thursday, the 22nd of September. Well, once again, I'm going to ask you to describe the scene for us, please. So the Hotel Theresa is a, is, a, is a wonderful building. It's, um, I think it's 13 storeys tall. It was built in 1913. It's, it's a very imposing, very beautifully designed building. It was, it was a kind of an architectural wonder when it was, um, when it was created. Is it still there today? Uh, it's Sorry, still there today, yeah. It's no longer a hotel, but it's, uh, it's been converted into offices. But the building is still there and it kind of dominates this part of Harlem. It's on um, 7th Avenue and 125th. And you've got a description of it Street. being the, the Waldorf of Harlem. Which yeah, it was known as the Waldorf of Harlem. And it's the scene that evening of a, of a sort of gala reception, which is being held in honour of the Teresa's most famous guest at that point, Fidel Castro. And it's a, it's a reception that's been organised at very short notice uh, by a group called the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, which was uh, a group of kind of left-leaning liberals or liberal-leaning leftists. I don't know what the best uh, term uh, for them is, but they're, 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 they're people who are, who are sympathetic towards the Cuban Revolution and they're, they're, they're working to try to build or sustain support for the Cuban Revolution within the United States. Um, I think it's probably worth at this point giving a tiny bit, stepping back just a little bit to, to explain how... Castro ended up in this particular hotel in this part of New York City, which um, is a bit off the the map, really, for diplomats or politicians coming to visit. Um, do you want to tell us how he got there? Because it's quite an interesting story. Yeah. So um, Fidel had arrived in New York on the on the eighteenth of September, Sunday, the eighteenth of September, for the opening of the UN General Assembly. And um, the Americans weren't very happy about him coming to New York. They'd um, they had no choice because he'd appointed himself head of the his country's UN delegation. So, because America hosted the United Nations headquarters, they were obliged to um, to admit him. But they made it very clear that he was unwelcome, and they in fact um, imposed uh, restrictions on his movements and said that he couldn't leave the island of Manhattan. And they claimed this was for his own protection because there were they said there were lots of people that would like to. Um, assassinate him basically and the cubans had found it very very difficult to secure hotel accommodations in the city um, almost every hotel they tried had, had turned them down 
And eventually the State Department, in conjunction with the United Nations, had persuaded the Shelburne Hotel in Midtown to take the Cubans in. But the hotel's owner, a guy called Edward Spatz, had made it very clear that he was only doing so under pressure, that he himself had no time for the Cubans. And he told journalists that he hated Castro. You know, one of the reasons that they go to Harlem is, is because it enables Fidel to do two things. Firstly, to show his own solidarity with the kind of, as he would put it, the sort of poor and humble people of, of Harlem, but also it draws international attention to American racism and racism not in the South, where people are aware of, of, of the Jim Crow uh, laws in the South, but racial discrimination and um, kind of uh, second class status of African-Americans in the urban North, in New York, in, in uh, America's most famous, most important city, a city which is seen as a sort of bastion of, of mid uh, 20th century American uh, liberalism. Um, so it, it, it becomes hugely embarrassing for the American government that the Cubans uh, kind of rock up in, 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 uh, in Harlem. Mm, um, but it's, a ter- it's, it's such a fun part of the book when you, you read about this. You, you said before that Castro is either very good at, um, well, we know he's very good at thinking on the cuff. I mean, all those years of guerrilla warfare probably made him quite spontaneous. And some people wondered whether this was a great ploy anyway, whether he had it all planned before he left Havana. These scenes that you describe of the crowds you know, outside the Teresa, and there's a, there's a lovely quote here. You say, uh, one person observed that that cat and his gang may have fought in those mountains and whipped that dictator Batista, but if they can stand the bed bugs in the Teresa, I'll know they're real revolutionaries. And it's that yeah, kind yeah. of lovely sense of them being at one with the people, and you know, like Harlem being the unofficial capital of Black America, and people just feeling a great sense of pride yeah i mean and he's greeted with huge crowds when he arrives and and then the, the, the crowds are there all the time really the, you know just even to get a glimpse of him at the at the, at the window of his ninth floor um hotel suite um and it's, it's partly because you know fidel had had already committed cuba to racial equality so he's he'd won a lot of support um, among among african americans but also you know he, he'd sort of stuck it to the the big wigs basically by coming to harlem uh, which mm. caused a lot of a, a lot of uh, sort of merriment but also as you said you know Harlem is an area which is usually kind of hidden off uh, from uh, the out from outside view a year before when Khrushchev had visited the United States at a time when relations with the United States were seeming to to seeming to get a bit uh, a bit better Khrushchev had, ins- had been really insistent that he wanted to visit Harlem he'd eventually been taken there by his State Department minders but they'd driven him there in early in the morning on the way to the airport when there was almost nobody there nobody on the streets so the Americans were really keen not to have Harlem drawn attention to. And, uh, of course, Castro um, Castro does that. Mm, just one last thing before we get to the evening of the, you know, the Thursday, the 22nd, because we'll talk about the events of then just in a moment. But I wanted to ask you what kind of aura or allure Castro had at this moment in 1960. I mean, it's quite difficult. Today, our politicians are usually more repellent than attractive, I suppose. But the but back then, is it something like Obama in 2008, someone new and fresh and exciting and with a slight air of danger? Is that is that it? Yeah, he's. I mean, he's. He's. Uh, he has a magnetic personality and a huge amount of uh, of charisma. And, and he's only thirty four or so, isn't he? At this point. Yeah, so he's he's young and um, he has this kind of beatnik kind of quality, this this rebellious quality that um, seems extremely uh, refreshing, I suppose. So yeah, he he kind of captures the imagination of all kinds of people who 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 see him as this kind of romantic, um, idealistic, rebellious figure. And a wonderful um, contrast with Eisenhower, of course. He's down in Midtown with the, I think, is it the chairman of the Augusta Golf Course or something? Yeah, like that. I mean, you can't have two more different personalities, really, than sort of, you know, the very formal, uh, you know, cons- small-c conservative, old-fashioned um, and elderly, you know, he's almost 70, um, president of the United States versus this, you know, a rebel. He has this sort of, you know, James Dean quality uh, um, uh, mm. to him. Um, so, so go yeah, on, I mean, tell- he, Tell us what happened on that night then, on the 22nd. Well, I think as a historian of the 1960s, it would be absolutely brilliant to be at this reception because partly of the, because of the, of the, of the guests who were there and, and what they sort of represent. So you have the kind of the great and the good of, of, of Harlem are there. You have uh, black freedom fighters like Robert F. Williams. You have leading uh, African-American playwrights and activists like... Um, uh, Leroy Jones, who later changes his name to Amira Baraka, uh, and uh, and Julian Mayfield. You have new left intellectuals um, like the um, 
Columbia University sociologist C. Wright Mills. Uh, you've got the beat poet Allen Ginsberg there, who, um, you know, hilariously at one point goes up to Castro, shakes him by the hand and asks him when he's going to legalise marijuana. It's the only point in the entire trip, possibly the only point in Castro's entire life where he's rendered speechless. Mm. Uh, he doesn't really know what to say. He eventually recovers his composure and says, you know, we're not going to do anything that will undermine the important work of building the Cuban revolution. <laughs> OK, that's a, that's a good reply. That's yeah, it's response. a good reply. It's a good reply. And everybody is kind of desperate to have their photograph taken with Fidel, to get his autograph, to spend some time in his presence. Uh, you've got the magnum photographer, Henri Cartier-Bresson, who's there. Yeah. Uh, snapping away with his camera. I know, if you could have anyone um, to take the photographs, he's not a bad person. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, I think it would be a kind of fun to go to a ball, isn't it? I well, I, th- I think it's almost, you um, know, we have these endless conversations about fantasy dinner parties. This is a kind of spin on this, isn't it? Just because of the the, the moment, of course, the setting in this slightly dilapidated yeah. but wonderful hotel, nonetheless. And... Yeah. Um, and and yeah, just the people there having their. I don't know if they had their daiquiris and and cigars in there, but it's um, it, yeah. it's it's such a vivid scene, isn't it? It's a really good one. It is, and I think it also it sort of it illustrates all, some of these strands of of the sixties as the decade unfolds, which are going to be kind of central to the story. So you've got the, the the black freedom struggle, you've got the new left, you've got the counterculture. At one point, there's a nice ceremony where the, the uh, one of the leaders of the Fair Play for Cuba committee, um, uh, Richard Gibson, hands Fidel a bust of Abraham Lincoln and, and quips, you know, from one one liberator to another. Someone cries out, you know, Fidel for US president and everybody cheers. So it's, it's a kind of a great occasion. Um, it'd be wonderful to see it. Hello. So here is the news about the competition that I mentioned right at the start of this episode. Faber, who are Simon's publishers, have very kindly given us two hardback copies of 10 Days in Harlem to give away to travel through time listeners. But that's not all. We've tried to make it even better. And I really think that we have done Jordan Lloyd at Colourgraph has also gone back to the history that we're talking about at this time when he's found a really intriguing black and white photograph of Fidel Castro at the UN in September 1960. He's huddled there with his compañeros and they're having a bit of a chatter about what's going to happen. Anyway, Jordan has colourised this image and the results are really sublime. You have to go and have a look and we're going to put it on our website anyway for you to have a look at. But we're also going to give you the chance to win it. So here's the prize. If your name comes out of the hat, you get a hardback copy of Simon's book and a print from Jordan. It's really good. We've got two sets of these to give away. All you have to do to be in with a chance of winning one of them is go to our website, tttpodcast.com, and sign up to our newsletter. Good luck. Well, I think that's the best segue that you can give us for the third scene that we're going to go to now. We'll leave that mag- <laughs> magnetic scene up at the uh, at the Teresa for a moment. And um, you said Fidel for US president. No, that's not going to happen, but something no. else might do. Can, where are we going to go next, please? It's not long after. No, it's just a few days later, and it's to uh, Chicago, and it's to CBS's McClurg's Court Studios, uh, which is a, conver- a converted sports arena. And it's on the evening of Monday, the 26th of September. And this is where the first ever televised presidential debate is going to take place between the Republican candidate, Vice President Nixon, and his Democratic challenger, Senator Kennedy. This is all very timely because I was just reading in the news this morning that, of course, we're entering presidential de- debate season. Trump wants to have a drug test for Biden. That'll be interesting. I don't know how this <laughs> is going to happen. Um, yeah, but this is... Yeah. This is a kind of progenitor. This is the daddy of um, presidential debates. Had there been a televised one before? No, there had not. There had been televised debates between um, between political candidates, but there hadn't been a, a presidential. There hadn't been a televised debate between the two presidential candidates before. All right. So, what happened on this particular one uh, on the twenty sixth of September? The debate is produced by a thirty eight year old guy called Don Hewitt. It's moderated by a veteran uh, journalist called Howard K. Uh, Smith. The format is. Relatively simple. The thing lasts lasts for an hour. Both candidates are asked to make an opening statement of about eight minutes in in length. They then field, I think it's ten questions from a panel of of journalists, and then there are closing statements. It's moderated by a veteran uh, journalist called Howard K. uh, Smith, and the focus of this first debate is on domestic issues, domestic domestic policy. Mm. Kennedy goes first. He gives a very polished, a very confident opening statement, and then uh, Nixon goes next, and he does a bit less well. Yeah, that this is in popular or political 
culture. This is a much talked about moment because of something that happens to, to Nixon. I was going to call him President Nixon, and that's very, very wrong, especially at this moment. But the um, yeah, something happens to Nixon. Can you tell us what goes goes on with him? Yeah, so, I mean, um, Nixon um, himself has not been in the best of health in the weeks leading up to the debate. He's still recovering from a, from a bout of, of a flu. He's also had a very painful knee infection. And there's a report that just as he arrives at the studios and gets out of the car, he actually bashes his, his knee against uh, the car door. And according to reports, he went sort of deathly pale. So he was clearly not in the best of shape. He'd also lost weight. So he's got that going on. He then refuses to wear TV makeup, I think partly because he... He, he, he fears being sort of uh, having it used against him by Kennedy as, as not being sort of macho enough. Although in the end, he does have an aide go out and buy some drugstore makeup just to cover up his um, his five o'clock shadow, which he was just an issue for him his whole political career. He's also wearing a grey suit and the, the back the backdrop for the um, debate is a, is a bit grey too. So he kind of starts to blend in with the with the scenery, which isn't great. He also sweats under the studio lights and his makeup starts to run. He doesn't look great. And it's a big contrast with Kennedy, who's been... He's just come back from a week campaigning in California and is, is well tanned and, and uh, looks extremely healthy and also has his sort of matinee idol looks going for him as well. And so, you know, the key to the, the outcome of this debate is that it's, it becomes all about the appearance. So people who listen to the debate on the radio score it as a draw, but people who watch it on the TV have Kennedy down as a, as a clear winner. At the end of the debate, the first sign that Nixon has that things haven't gone well is when his secretary, Rosemary Woods, comes up to him and says that his mother had just called to ask whether he was ill. Yeah, it, it's it's really about the, appear, the appearance. Mm. Uh, Richard Daly, the mayor of Chicago, is watching the debate on TV and he's said to have exclaimed, my God, they've embalmed him before he even died. So, you know, I've, I've looked at, and you, you know, you can look at the, at the debate itself. It's on, it, it's on YouTube. I don't think Nixon looks that bad. I don't think it's as bad as all that, but that's the take on it. That's the popular take that Nixon looks a bit like death warmed up. I suppose it's become a bit of a, a warning, cautionary tale in politics that you have to be prepared for these things very carefully to the point that some people are so prepared nowadays that they um, they kind of also become very wooden again. But um, I suppose is Nixon really a victim of being underprepared here? Is he a man out of time who doesn't understand the power of this new media? Or do you think it's just a confluence of quite bad luck? You know, he's banged his knee, he's feeling nervous, he's, you know, got this quite um, vivacious opponent. Is it something, how would you characterise it? I think there's definitely some under preparation, certainly compared to the Kennedy team, which had, which had really prepared extremely thoroughly for the, for the, for the debate. And also Kennedy understood TV instinctively in a way that Nixon didn't. One of the things that Kennedy does is that when he's answering questions from the journalists, he doesn't look at the journalists who've asked the questions. He looks directly into the TV camera and addresses the TV audience. Whereas Nixon, when he's asked a question, he, he tends to glance towards the journalist who's asked it. And that, when you look at it on the TV, makes him look a bit a bit shifty because he's not really looking at the at you, the, yeah. uh, the TV viewer. So there's definitely some under preparation. There is bad luck. Nixon does much better in the next three debates. Uh, he was also much healthier by then. He puts on some weight. He, I think he drinks four milkshakes a day to put weight back on. Okay. Um, but Nixon also gets his tactics wrong. Nixon goes into this first debate determined to try to move away from his reputation, which is as Eisenhower's attack dog or hatchet man. And he tries to be more sort of emollient, more consensual. Empathetic. And, and so rather than attacking Kennedy, he, he, he spends a lot of his time agreeing with Kennedy. And that means that he, he loses the initiative in this first debate. So rhetorically and politically, his strategy is wrong for that debate as well. Mm, it's um, it's a really fascinating scene to be there as well. I mean, a lot, a lot of, of what we're talking about today, something that runs through all the three scenes, is um, journalism, because you have um, in the first scene the kind of the, the newspaper reports about the sit-ins. Then in the second, you have the kind of, you know, again, it's more um, maybe the society papers or the political pages or the op-eds or whatever, talking about Castro. But then we get to television and this really exciting moment in that. So to sit in an American television studio in September 1960 would also be to feel the force, the full force of a new technological power. Yeah. And what I'd really like to do is to sort of, you know, observe both these two fascinating characters, you know, Nixon and Kennedy are compelling personalities. They're fascinating individuals. Uh, they have great strengths, great flaws. Um, they're, 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 they're kind of, you know, totally fascinating in their own right. I'd like to sort of circulate among their advisors and, and try and hear what they're 
making of this debate as it unfolds, but also to witness this new medium, um, which is going to become ever more important in the way that politics is consumed and, and kind of framed in the United States. Interestingly, at the end of the debate, a lot of the people involved with it were quite uh, sort of torn about it. They, they, they sort of, they recognised the, the power of television, but, but were not at all convinced that it was a good thing. So Don Hewitt said, um, made a comment about, you know, this is a, you know, going on appearances is how you pick Miss America. It's no way to pick up a, a president. Uh, he described this first yeah. debate as uh, the worst night that ever happened in American politics because they sort of worried that, as you said, the focus is going to shift onto appearance and symbolism rather than substance and 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 uh, the kind of under uh, and policy really. Well, just give us a little overview of Nixon. You said that he was known very much as Eisenhower's fixer or his attack dog. Did he already have that reputation that he certainly had later on as a as a bit of a bruiser? I think that's the best way I can yeah. put it. Yeah, he did. I mean, he played a leading role in the um, uh, politics of anti-communism during the 1950s and as a congressman in the late 1940s. Yeah, he'd attra- he definitely attracted that reputation. And when he was elected to the Senate in 1950, he defeated a liberal Democrat called Helen Gagan Douglas. He had uh, attacked her for being a communist sympathiser, basically described her as, a, as a being a pink lady. So, yeah, he, 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 had, that, he had a reputation for being a, a, yeah, a political bruiser, really. I mean, I think Nixon and Kennedy are, are, are really fascinating to compare because they, they have similarities, right? They, they're both uh, are World War II heroes. They both served in the U.S. Navy in the, in the Pacific, uh, won a clutch of medals for their, for their service. They both are elected to Congress in the same year, 1946, the midterm elections at the end of the Second World War. They both enjoy a meteoric political rise. Uh, Nixon is elected to the Senate in 1950, becomes Eisenhower's running mate in 52. Kennedy uh, elected to the Senate in 1952, almost is cho- is almost chosen comes very close to being chosen as the uh, vice presidential candidate in 1956 so their their careers sort of track each other but they're very different characters nixon nixon is insecure um he's uncomfortable in his own skin um he grew up kind of in pretty austere uh, circumstances K- kennedy's led a, a charmed something of a charmed life a, a life of great of great uh, privilege um and yet the contest between them becomes a kind of defining moment in the history of the decade. Mm. Um, Do we know anything about the... Uh, maybe this is a bit of a gossipy question, but I'll get it in anyway because I'm interested. Do we know if there was any kind of real dislike between the two or was it was a, was a respect between the two of them as rivals or is it difficult to, to make that judgment? Um, I think th- I think there was... I think there was respect. There was definitely respect, but but I don't think they but they they weren't great friends. Um, mm. They weren't great friends. I think when um, you know I think when when Nixon uh, arrives at the at Chicago uh, uh, at the studios, he approaches Nixon and, and tries to make some small talk, but it, it's all very sort of stiff. So I think they're wary of each, of each other. Well, my last point is um, maybe one that will tie this together a little bit because you actually say at the beginning of the book that. If anything, there's more similarities in the backgrounds of Kennedy and Castro, which is quite an interesting angle, I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think if they'd met, I think they might have got on. You know, they're both um, born to relative privilege. Uh, Castro grows up in a sort of plantation style house on a a large sugar farm that his father owns. Both men are um, are the sons of, of really larger than life, somewhat overbearing fathers. Both are, are, are fervent sort of patriots who become kind of symbols for a, a new generation in their own respective countries. So I think they have that, all of that in, in, uh, in common. They're also both great orators and have a, a power with, uh, with the spoken word, which, which kind of helps to inspire uh, people to, to kind of rally around and support them. Mm-hmm. So I think they have this, they have those things in common. So I, I think, and I think they both have a sort of sense of fun too. I think, that, I think they would have got on if they'd met. Well, it's a wonderful kind of what if, you know, yeah. moment. and uh, Kennedy and Castro, it's, it could almost be a stage play in the West End. But there, we'll, we'll have to leave that as, as a thing. I mean, t- great to imagine us being there, seeing Kennedy the Orator talk. Of course, what makes all of the action you describe in the book all the more like kind of freighted with energy is the knowledge that we have the Bay of Pigs fiasco the the year after in the April. And then, of course, that really perilous moment, I think, in October 1962 of the missile crisis. Yeah. But yeah. Um, that's all to come. And this is a really, really fascinating prelude. The book, I think, is um, 
it, it's a wonderful read because you, there's so much primary material in there. It's very of the moment. Let's come back to 2020. But before we do, can I just ask you my last question, which is yeah, of course, if you yeah. can bring if you could bring a tangible object back to have as a talisman for, <laughs> for your journey or to yeah. have in your office, what would you like? Gosh, it's a tr- that's a tricky question. There's so many things I'd like to kind of grab hold of on these visits. But I, I think I would bring back one of Fidel's cigars. <laughs> okay, well, one of the ones that he'd taken maybe to the Teresa, maybe that might be a good one. Yeah, yeah, and I'd I'd have it. I'd maybe have it on a little wooden platform on my on my desk. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks no, for... thanks. It was great. Really yeah. good fun. That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Professor Simon Hall about the year 1960. There's, of course, so much more about the scenes that we explore in this episode in Simon's new book, Ten Days in Harlem, Fidel Castro and the Making of the 1960s. It's being published next week in hardback by Faber. It's a stirring, fast-paced, beautifully researched read, well worth checking out. Remember that we've teamed up with Faber and Jordan Lloyd at Colourgraph to give away two great prizes. If your name comes out of the hat on the 14th of September, you'll win a hardback copy of Simon's book and a superb colourised print of Castro at the UN in September 1960. All you have to do to be in with a chance is to head to our website, which is tttpodcast.com, and sign up to our newsletter. We're going to be back next Tuesday for another adventure into the past. This time we're off to a rather different period of time, 126,000 years ago. So whatever your politics, you'll be safe from either Fidel Castro or Richard Nixon. But from me, for now, that's it. Thank you very much for listening today. Goodbye.